you can show the call there and inshallah somebody may attend. Sajid Abbas, mashallah. Afridi Mondal. Abdul Azim, assalamu alaikum, alaikum salam. Iman Hassan, I love you, sir, I love you too. Dhananjay Singh. Abu Bakr Goni. Shah Farhan Labib Aman. Habib Rahman. Tahmid Zarif. Saima Ahmed. Akram Khan. Zakaria Zaki. Kakam Sabar, Allahu Akbar, Muhammad Arfin Reza, many are saying salams. Wa alaikum salam to all of you, and Jazakallah for all your duas. On the YouTube, we have Akhari Badah, Hashir Uzair, Hazur Ahmad, Musab Sharif, Majbur Rahim, Muhammad Asif, Akari Bada, Jaharul Islam, Nayam Ahmad, Zahid Shahir, Mazarul Islam, Musab Sharif, Fahad Purush, Sheikh Habib, Farhat Ansari, Assalamu Alaikum, Alaikum Salam, Jadakallah for all your duas. The question posed on the YouTube is Rimsha Rafi. Can pregnant women pray Salah while sitting? As far as praying Salah is concerned, if a person is healthy, he should pray as the prayer has been taught by beloved Prophet. But if a person is sick or has a medical problem, it is perfectly permitted for him to sit down and pray. As Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 100 and 102, that you can pray while standing, you can pray while uh, sitting, while lying, it's permitted. So if you have a problem, if you're pregnant, and if you feel you cannot stand, and you want to, you are more comfortable sitting and praying, it's perfectly permitted. If you have a knee problem, and if you cannot do sujood, or go down and sit on the chair, if it's a medical problem where it's difficult, and painful for a person to do all the postures in the Salah, then it's very well perfected. You can pray while sitting. If you're so sick that you cannot sit down, you can even pray, pray while lying. All these are permitted. The next question. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Muhammad Musaddiq. I am from Maharashtra, India. I'm 17 years old. As we know, IPL, IPL is the Indian Premier League. It's a cricket uh, tournament that takes place in India. Is, as we know, IPL is going on. So there are many apps from which we can earn money by predicting the future score of so-and-so team will win, etc. Is this thing related to gambling and is it permissible in Islam? Can I earn money from it? Predicting whether any team will win in a particular type of sport, whether it be cricket, whether it be football, predicting, and if you are right, you get money. This comes under the category of gambling, that you pay a particular amount of money, and if your prediction comes right, you may get five times, you may get ten times, depending upon what has been told. This is nothing but gambling. It is nothing but gambling. And Allah says in the Quran in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 90. 
Allah says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amunu, O you believe, inna mal khamru wal maisuru, most certainly intoxicants and gambling, wal ansabu wal azlamu, dedication of stones, divination of arrows, rich summa namli shaitan, rich summa namli shaitan, these are certain thanibuk, fash tanibu la Allah kum tafluhun, fash tanibu la Allah kum tafluhun, abstain from this hanibuk that you may prosper. So Quran clearly said that intoxicants, gambling, dedication of stones, divination of arrows, all these are Satan's handiwork, abstain from it that you may prosper. So such type of events where you have to put money and you get a bigger amount if you turn out to be right, if your production does not be right, it is nothing but gambling and it is prohibited. As far as getting involved in sports in which the prizes are given. You don't have to put any money, but if you take part in a sport and if prizes are given, in this case, our beloved Prophet said that prizes in terms of money can only be given in cases of horse racing or camel racing or archery. Because all these make a person more fit for doing jihad, for fighting. So the scholars have said that if you take part in any sports, which involve and helps you in making yourself fit for jihad, it is permitted. Or for making you improve in your religion, like competitions of Kirat or Hadith competition or the Sira competition. So these competitions which get you closer to Islam or makes you more fit, like archery, horse riding, camel racing, more fit to do jihad is permitted. But those sports, which doesn't benefit you at all in terms of jihad or doesn't benefit you it come closer to Islam, like cricket, etc. So even doing competitions of such thing and winning prizes for such thing, even though it's not considered as gambling, it is not permitted in Islam because winning prizes of such competitions, such sports, we don't get you closer to the deen, don't make you more fit for jihad or so, it is prohibited. The next question. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Zakir Naik, sir. I am from Bangladesh. In profession, I am a textile engineer. I'm married for last one year. Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me a perfect person as my life partner. I wanted to talk with you directly for some nasiha. Although I'm belonging to a Muslim family, my Islamic knowledge is very poor. I am only a namesake Muslim. I want to make myself a true Muslim so that I may die with faith. After 26 years of life, I have realized that in these 26 years, my book of virtue is zero. And I understand from the knowledge of good and evil that I have committed many sins. These sins are constantly haunting me Fear of death is rampant. If I die now, I have nothing to take with me. I would like to share with you some more things which may not be possible in the message. I know there are many books of Hadith, there are many books of Islam, but it may take a long time to find out the necessary Hadith to atone for my sins. You know a lot about Islam. If you can help me by knowing the sins I've committed, how can I atone my sins? And when Allah takes me to him, I can go to him with full faith. I'm surrounded by sins. There is just sin spread all around. How do I get out of here? Please, I'm requesting you to help me out. The brother from Bangladesh, who's a textile engineer, he has mentioned that he's 26 years old and he's involved in a lot of sins and he has realized it is wrong and he wants to atone for them. How will he come to know which are the sins and how should he atone for it? The sins can be broadly classified into major sins and minor sins. There are two types of sins. As far as the minor sins are concerned, our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that praying five times daily or praying one Juma to the other Juma of fasting from, Ram, from, Ram, from, from one Ramzan to the other Ramzan, 
it washes away your sins. Here the prophet is referring to minor sins, not the major sins. So if you pass, so if you pray five times a day and you keep on praying, inshallah your minor sins will be forgiven. If you pray Jummah, one Jummah to the next Jummah, inshallah Allah will forgive all your other sins in between these two Jummah. Or if you fast from one Ramadan to the next Ramadan, fast the full month of Ramadan, then fast the next Ramadan, inshallah Allah will forgive your sins in the month of Ramadan. And there are various hadith. Our beloved Prophet also said that if you fast during Muharram, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the Ashura, on the 10th of Muharram, then Allah will forgive your sins of one year of the previous year, complete year. Our beloved Prophet also said that if you fast on the day of Arafah, Allah will forgive your sin of the previous year as well as the sin of the coming year. Now all these sins that the Prophet is talking about forgiveness, it is talking about minor sin, not the major sin. So number one brother for me, to give you advice, as you have mentioned that you are involved in various sins and you are surrounded by sins, number one you should try and identify which are your major sins. Major sin is a sin which has been called a major sin, either in the Quran or the Hadith, number one. Number two, it is a sin for which the punishment is mentioned in this world. Or it's a sin for which punishment is mentioned in the next life, in the hereafter. Fourth, it is a sin which Allah and his messenger has cursed you. Or fifth, it's a sin which will put you into the hellfire. So if it falls under any of these five criteria, it is called a major sin. And according to Hadith of Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that there are seven major sins, but 70 is more closer to seven. So there are scholars who have identified that which will be these major sins. Some are mentioned as major sins in the Hadith or Quran, which is without doubt, but some is not mentioned as major sin, but the punishment is mentioned to scholars say when these are major sins. There's a book written by Imam Madhabi called as Kabair, or major sins, and he lists the 70 major sins in order, according to the Quran and Hadith, what he feels is number one, right up to number 70. And he puts number one as shirk, based on the verse of the Quran of Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 48 and in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 116 that Allah if he pleases he will forgive any sin but the sin of shirk he will not forgive. So if a person dies as a mushrik without repenting or without rectifying he is 100% going to be in hell forever. So number one sin, major sin is shirk. Number two according to Imam Adabi is murder. Number three is black magic or witchcraft or sorcery. Number four is not offering salah. Number five is not giving zakat if you have to give zakat. Number six, not fasting in the month of Ramadan if you're supposed to fast, if, you're, if you are healthy and if you're adult and if it's compulsory and don't fast, that is sin number, major sin number six. Major sin number seven is not performing hajj if you are supposed to perform Hajj, if Allah has given you the health and the wealth to perform Hajj, and if you don't perform, it is a major sin. Major sin number eight is disrespect and disobedience to your parents. Number nine is abandoning your relatives. Number 10 is fornication and adultery. Number 11 is homosexuality and sodomy. Number 12 is giving or taking of interest, that is riba, usury. Number 13 is usurping the wealth of the orphans. Number 14 is lying against Allah and his messenger. Number 15 is running, running away from the battlefield. Number 16 is deceit, wrongfulness and oppression by a ruler. <coughs> Number 17 is being arrogant. Number 18 is bearing false witness. Number 19 is alcohol. 
Number 20 is gambling. And the list continues. You can go to my Facebook. And there, or you can go to my Pinterest. Pinterest is easier. You go to the Pinterest and the various boards. One of the boards is on major sin. And I have listed all the 70 major sins as per Imam al-Dhabi in order and giving the various hadith and the Quranic verses why it's a major sin. You can go and you can find out. So number one, a person should be careful about major sins. Some of the scholars call it as grave major sin and some scholars have listed more major sins even besides the 70 major sins. So some say grave major sin, others are major sin, then there may be moderate sin, minor sin, but broadly there is major sin and minor sins. So my request to you, brother, is that go to my Facebook, identify which are the major sins, and number one, you have to stop the major sin and repent for the major sin. Your major sins cannot be washed away by offering salah or by fasting. You have to repent and ask for forgiveness. And there are five criteria for anyone to repent for any of the major sins he has done. Number one is agree it is wrong. Number two is that he should stop it immediately. Number three, he should ask for forgiveness. Number four, he should undo it if he can. For example, if he's robbed, stealing is a major sin, he should give it back to the rightful owner. If he cannot undo it, then there's no option. Number five is he should not repeat it again. So for your repentance to be accepted, first you have to agree the sin that you're doing is wrong. Number one, number two, you have to stop it immediately. Number three, ask for forgiveness, repent to Allah and ask for his forgiveness. Number four, undo it if you can. Number five, not to repeat it again. And inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive you. What we have to remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Rahman or Rahim. He is Ghafur or Rahim. And every chapter of the glorious Quran, except for chapter number nine, Surah Tawbah, it begins with the formula, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. What we have to realize, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is most forgiving. And irrespective of whatever sin you have done, brother, irrespective, if you ask for forgiveness sincerely, Allah will forgive you. Even if your sins are as high as the mountain, Allah will forgive you as long as you ask sincerely and I've mentioned the five criteria. The various hadith talking about that, where Allah says that all my servants who have sinned the full day, if they ask for forgiveness in the night, I'll forgive them. All my servants who have sinned the full night, in the morning if they ask for forgiveness, I'll forgive them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are various hadith, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the last one third of the night, he comes down at the lower heaven and he asks, is there anyone who asks for anything and I will give him? Is there anyone who wants to ask forgiveness? I'll forgive him. So this is the time where it is recommended that we offer tahajjud. So besides offering five times salah, see if you don't do the major sin, my request to you would be offer five times salah in Jamaat, in mosque. It is a fard. If you don't do it, it's the fourth major sin. If you start offering salah, inshallah, the connection of Allah with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep on increasing. And see to it that you also offer the tahajjud, the qayamul layl, preferably in the last one third of the night. And at this time, when in your qayam, if you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgiveness, especially in your sujood, in the sajda, while you prostrate, inshallah Allah will forgive you. There is a saying, there is a scholar who said that, a person cannot say that he has tried everything unless he asks Allah in tajjud in the last one third of night. That means you cannot say that you have tried everything until you have asked Allah in the last one-third of night tajjud. 
because that's the time when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts the prayer. There are various other occasions. For example, our beloved Prophet said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept your prayer one hour after Asr, before the Friday ends. So on Juma, after Asr, before the Maghrib, before Friday ends, if you ask during that one hour, that's an hour for your dua to be accepted, for your forgiveness to be accepted. So my advice to you would be, besides offering five times salah, or for tajjud salah, even pray during that one hour of Juma, and inshallah you'll find there'll be a world of a difference, your iman will increase, and please, irrespective of what your sins are, don't think that your sins are so high that it cannot be forgiven, because the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is far higher than any sinner in the world. And there are various hadith. You may have heard of the hadith, which says that there was a lady who was a prostitute and she gave water to a thirsty dog and Allah liked that one act of that lady and forgave all the sins and put her in Jannah. Imagine one act. We have the other hadith where a lady was was a practicing Muslim, but she did not treat the cat justly. She used to tie and did not give food. Because of that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put her in hell. And there's a hadith of a Prophet وسلم, who said that there is a person who does all the evils in the world. So much so that he is one arm's length from the hell. And he does a good deed. Allah likes it and Allah puts him in Jannah. There's a person who has done all good deeds in his life. So much so that he is one arm's length from heaven, from Jannah. And he does an evil deed and Allah puts him in Jannah, puts him in hell. So this is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That even if you have done as many sins that are possible, more than a mountain, if you ask for sincere forgiveness, Inshallah, Allah will forgive you. So my request to you, brother, is that see to it that you read more books, try and find out which are the major sins, try and avoid the major sins, and after you stop the major sins, try and avoid even the minor sins, alhamdulillah, but avoiding the major sins is a must, asking the, for forgiveness for these is a must, and Inshallah, Inshallah, I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he, that he puts you on the Sarat al-Mustaqeem and forgives all your sins, and inshallah, inshallah, make you a practicing Muslim so that inshallah Allah puts you in Jannah, inshallah. We have on the Facebook Muhammad Arfin Raza, Akib Azad, Kaknamin Sabar, Zakaria Zaki, Muhammad Shaheen Alam, Aryan Jowil, Aryan Jowil, Akram Khan. Muhammad Kamzi Kamara, Muhammad Faridul Islam, Afridi Mondal, I love you sir, I love you too, Saima Ahmed, Hafiz Kanisa, Tahmid Zarif, Afridi Mondal, We have on the YouTube, Noor Amin, Mustafa Ahmed, Aqa Sheikh, Muhammad K, Abdullah, Abshar Sayyid, Sayyid Mazin, Muhammad Sharik, Kamran Ali, Samad Meman, Siddiqui Pranto, Assalamu alaikum wa alaikum salam. Jazakallah for your duas. I am Muntazir from Hyderabad, India. Is it fair and just if a non Muslim does countless major sins and after he accepts Islam, all of them are forgiven?
The question asks is that is it justified and fair if a non-Muslim does countless major sins and if he accepts Islam, all are forgiven. And the question is correct that whenever a mushrik or a non-Muslim accepts Islam, all his previous sins are forgiven. All his good work is there, all his previous sins are forgiven. Not only are the previous sins forgiven, the more evil and the sins he did, when he accepts Islam, all that is converted to positive. Alhamdulillah. Regarding the question, is it fair, is it justified? Yes, it is justified. Because here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if a person is a non-Muslim, and if he's doing sin of having alcohol, of gambling, of doing shirk, and once he comes close to Islam, he realizes the haqq, he realizes that there's no God worthy of worship except Allah, and Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the messenger of Allah, and he follows the advice, of course. And this is the moment he accepts, imagine, because to leave the previous way of life is very difficult. For a person who is born and he's, he's a non-Muslim for many years, maybe 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, he led his life and then he realizes the truth. For him to leave, it requires a lot of courage, it requires a lot of guts, it requires a lot of passion. So that's the reason when a person agrees what he's doing wrong and he accepts the fold of Islam and says the shahada, all his previous sins are forgiven. And it's very difficult for a person who has been brought up like a non-Muslim having alcohol, gambling, telling lies, doing wrong things, and then to leave all this is very difficult. So, according to me, it is justified. And that doesn't mean that the Muslim, if he does sin, he'll not be forgiven. If you heard my previous answer, where one of the Muslim brothers asked, he had done many major sins and he has sinned, what to do? I told him, ask for forgiveness. So not that you have to be a non-Muslim to have all your sins forgiven. Even if you're a Muslim and you have done something wrong and I've done major sin, all you have to do is ask for sincere forgiveness. And as I mentioned in my earlier answer, for sincere repentance and forgiveness, there are five criteria. Number one, you may have done countless number of sins. What you should do? Agree that thing is wrong. Uh, agree that what you're doing is wrong, number one. Number two, you stop it. Number three, ask for forgiveness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number four, undo it if you can. If you have robbed and you can return the thing you have robbed, okay, turn it back. Number five, is that do not do it in future. So besides Allah giving an opportunity for the non-Muslim to forgive all the sin, even the Muslims can be forgiven. And if you have heard my earlier answer, the details are given, how to ask for forgiveness. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Rahman or Rahim is giving us hundreds of opportunity, thousands of opportunity for Allah to forgive our sins if we have done any. And he is giving us thousands of opportunity to enter Jannah. So this life, as Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Mulk, chapter number 67, verse number 2, Allah has created death and life to test which of his good deeds. So Allah has made this life as a test for the hereafter. And we should follow the commandments of Allah and follow his guidance and inshallah all of us who follow his guidance will be inshallah put into Jannah. Hope that answers the question. <clears throat> Noor Ashraf from Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. After doing the ruku, when we stand, should we again tie our hands or should we keep them free at the sides? The question posed by Noor Ashraf is that after we get up from the ruku in our salah, should we tie our hands? on the chest or should we keep it at the sides? Regarding where should we keep our hands after we get up from the ruku, according to majority of the scholars, after you get up from ruku, we should keep our hands on the sides. According to Imam Abu Hanifa, according to Imam Malik, according to Imam Shafi, 
the view is that we should keep our hands at the sides after we get up from ruku. As far as the view of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal is concerned, he had two views, that if you want, you can keep it at the side. If you want to tie it on the chest, keep it on the chest, even that is permissible. There, yet, there are some scholars who say that after ruku, the hands should be kept on the chest. This they derive, there are various hadiths we say, that in the ruku, your hand should be on the knee. In the sujood, your hand should be on the ground. In julus, while sitting for tayyad, you keep your hands on your thighs. In kayam, your hand, your right hand should be above your left forearm. And this, all of us agree, all the Muslims agree, there are various hadith which says that in kayam, your right hand should be above your left forearm. This is all. Now, majority of the scholars, what they say, in Kayam, yes, we have to keep your right hand over the left hand. But when we get up from Ruku, that is not Kayam. The other scholars, though minority number, what they say that when you get up from Ruku, when you stand up, even that is Kayam. So here the scholars differ, majority, they say that when you get up from Ruku, that is not part of Qayyam, it is just in between portion after getting up from Ruku and before going into Sajda. But the other group, which is a minority, they say no, even this is Qayyam, therefore we are going to keep our right hand over the left hand. Further it's mentioned in the Hadith of Sahih Bukhari, volume number one, Hadith number eight to eight, that the Prophet peace be upon him. When he got up from the ruku, his vertebra came back to the normal position. That when the Prophet got up from the ruku, he stood up and his vertebra came to the normal position. There's one more hadith in Sunan Ibn Majah, or number one, hadith number 863, where it says that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he got up from his ruku, all his bone returned to its position. Now, the majority of the scholars who say that the hand should be kept on the side, they said yes. Here it says the bones returned to its original position. That is the normal position at the side. The other group we say that it returned to the original position means where were the bones before the person went into Ruku, it was on the chest. But what they failed to realize that the first hadith of Bukhari, it says in the normal position, the vertebra, and the backbone, will go to the normal position. So this hadith also when it says returns, it means return to the normal position, not the position before, the normal position. And the normal position is hands on the side. So here the scholars are divided. Among the scholars who say, that the hand should be kept on the chest, right over the left forearm, right hand over the left forearm, after you get up from Ruku, are scholars like Sheikh bin Baz, Sheikh Utaymi, these scholars say that your hand should be on the chest after Ruku. But according to Sheikh Nasruddin Albani, he says no, if you read his book on the Prophet's prayer, he says that there is no hadith at all. There is no evidence from, from the Messenger of Allah or from any of the Sahabas that after Ruku you have to keep the hand on the chest. And he categorically says that it should be on the side. To give the answer, this is a very minor issue. And I feel that it's a minor issue, though the majority of the scholars say that it should be at the side, but if someone keeps on the chest, it is not a major issue, not that the salah will not be accepted, or it's just a minor issue. So those people who keep on the side should not criticize those people who keep the hand on the chest after getting him from Ruku, and those who keep it on the chest should not criticize those people who are keeping on the sides. But regarding the question, the majority of the fuqahs and the scholars, all the first three emmas, and, and Ahmad ibn Hanbal, may Allah be 
Allah have mercy on him. According to Nasrul al-Bani, though he said that you can keep the hand on the side or on the chest, he always kept it on the side. According to Nasrul al-Bani. So he said that was his opinion, but his practice was keeping on the sides, and that is the correct opinion according to Nasrul al-Bani. But whatever the difference is there, we Muslims should not fight over it. It's a minor issue. Hope that answers the question. The next question, Assalamu alaikum. I am Samoun from Hora, West Bengal, India. My question is, can we greet a non-Muslim teacher with good morning or good afternoon when he or she arrives in the classroom? As far as wishing good morning to a non-Muslim teacher or good afternoon, it is perfectly fine in Islam. As long as the greeting is good, you can wish any greeting which is good and it should not be against the Sharia. So good morning is a good greeting. It may not be the best, but it's permissible. So if the teacher comes and you wish any greeting, as long as it is not against the Sharia and it's a good greeting, you can wish. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 86, وَإِذَا حُيِّتُمْ بِتَّهِيَتٍ فَحَيُّ بِأَحْسَنَ مِنْهَا أَوْ رُدُّوهَا إِنَّ اللَّهَ قَانَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْنْ حَسِيمًا Which means that if anyone greets you or wishes you courteously, wish back more courteously or at least the same. For Allah is careful in keeping of accounts. So, greeting is good. As far as greeting, getting the Muslims are concerned, Allah also says in the Quran that whenever you meet a believer, say salamu alaikum. Whenever you meet those people who believe in the signs of Allah, wish them salamu alaikum. And there are various hadith. So, for a Muslim, it is compulsory when he meets another Muslim, he should say assalamu alaikum. But if you are meeting a non Muslim, if you say good morning, there's no problem at all. Between the two greetings, there's a world of reference. What does Islam recommend? Is assalamu alaikum. May peace be on you. If you compare this greeting with the greeting of the non-Muslim or the Westerner, that is good morning. You know, the teacher is coming to your class. The teacher may have had a fight with his wife. And he may be cursing the morning. But when he comes to the class, all the students say, good morning, sir. Imagine he had a fight with his wife. He may be cursing that morning. He may be wishing that this morning doesn't come again. And the students are wishing him good morning. In case of the Islamic greeting, may peace be on you. Irrespective whether it's a good morning or a bad morning, whether it is raining cats or dogs, whether, whether a person had a fight with his wife or not. May peace be on you is excellent. Even if it is happy morning, peace be on you is good. Even if it is a sad morning, peace be on you is good. So the Islamic greeting is more practical and more appropriate. And further it says in the Quran, Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse 86, if someone wishes you, wish back more courteously. For example, if someone says, Assalamu alaikum, you have to wish back, Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. If someone says assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, you have to wish back wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Or if someone wishes assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh, if you cannot improve it, at least wish back the same wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Or maybe someone says assalamu alaikum and you're going to blabbing wa alaikum assalam. The words are the same, but you know the emotion is there. So even this is better. So Allah advises in the Quran, if someone wishes you, wish back more courteously or at least the same. So but naturally as we discuss, Assalamu Alaikum is a universal greeting, is much better. And this was the greeting used even by Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. If you read the Bible in the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 24, verse number 36, when Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, goes to the upper room and he meets the apostle, he says, Shalom Alaikum, peace be on you. Same thing. In Hebrew, Shalom Alaikum. In Arabic, Assalamu Alaikum. And if suppose someone wishes you good morning, 
your reply should be very good morning because very good morning is better than good morning or least you can do is you can wish back good morning so if the teacher comes and wishes you good morning it's preferable for you to reply very good morning or at least the same so these are the guidance given in the quran that islam is getting is far superior but there's no problem wishing any other greeting as long as it is not against the sharia there may be certain greetings which may be against the sharia for example in in hindu culture they say namaste now namaste means i bow to you this is not correct so you cannot repeat that namaste saying good morning no problem good afternoon no problem but saying namaste meaning i bow down to you idam namame coming from the sanskrit word idam namame so this you cannot say but other greeting as long as it is not against the sharia it's not against quran and hadith if it is a good greeting you can wish there's no problem at all the next question from firoz from zurich switzerland i am a big fan of you and may allah bless you jazakallah shukran amen i want to ask you regarding interest as these days it's difficult to avoid getting interest from the bank and also to pay by credit cards if i get interest but i don't eat it instead i use it to pay my bills like repairs and electricity and salary etc is it okay or is it haram the firoz from zurich says asked a question it's very difficult to stay away from riba from interest the credit cards but if i get the interest is it okay if i don't eat it but pay use it for paying my electric bills my telephone bills etc many people have a misconception that what is prohibited is not to eat food from the interest money not to eat food from the interest money is prohibited but interest per se is haram and there are no less than 8 times in the quran where allah uses the word riba interest and it is mentioned in haram and the most strictest warning is in surah baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 278 and 279 where allah says that if you give up not your demands of riba then take notice of a war from allah and his rasul that means if you give up not your demand from riba that you involve you indulge in interest in riba in usury then allah and his rasul will wage a war against you according to imam madhabi it is the 12th major sin in islam giving interest is haram taking interest is also haram both are haram and regarding a question if interest is haram can i pay my electric bill if you are paying your electric bill is benefiting you that you don't have to pay electricity bill you don't have to pay telephone bill it is not permitted at all even if you take interest and give in charity to others generally according to me it's not permitted yes if you have taken interest unknowingly and today you realize it is wrong it is haram and then you say i will not keep in the saving account i will not keep in fixed deposit account and now i'll stop it and then if you have some interest money that you can give in charity you cannot use it for yourself neither for eating food neither for any benefit neither for paying electric bill or any other bill you cannot use it on yourself or on any of your duties you can however give it as charity to other people or for building toilets etc but you cannot keep on keeping in the bank and every year taking the interest and giving in charity even that is wrong because allah says in the quran taking interest is haram when you giving in charity first you have to take and then give so even giving charity regularly according to me is prohibited yes if you were involving in riba and you realize today it is haram and if you have some money that you can give in charity don't utilize on yourself or you can build toilets with it but continuously doing that and giving in charity according to me even that's not permitted hope that's the question next question is from aisha munir from lahore pakistan i am a housewife i completed masters in business administration that is mba i want to know as a muslim woman what profession should i adopt i want to contribute to society in a better way 
I don't want to die as a common person. Sister Aisha Muni has asked a very important question that she has done an MBA, Master's in Business Administration. She does not want to die as a common person. She says what profession she, she takes so that she benefits the Ummah. As far for a lady, the best and the most important work and profession is that of a mother. Number one, that if you are a mother, you should see to it that you are a very good mother to your children. Because you are going to build the next generation. And as Allah SWT says in the Quran, that take, you take care of yourself and your family and save them from the hellfire. And the beloved Prophet ﷺ said that a leader of the ummah should take care of his flock. A man who's head of the family should take care of his family and a woman should see to it that the husbands and her children that are there, she takes care of the children. So based on this, number one, the most important is that for a woman, she should be a good mother. Besides being a mother or if you're not married, the best profession that you can take, according to me, is of a da'i. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Fusilat, chapter number 41, verse number 33, Allah says, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَالَ مِمَّنْ ضَعِيلَ اللَّهِ وَآمِلُ صَالِحَوْمْ وَقَالَ إِنَّنِ مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Who is better in speech than one who invites to the way of their Lord, works righteousness and says that I'm Muslim. So the best profession for any Muslim, whether man or woman, it is to become a da'i. Calling people to the way of Allah is the best profession. And even if you're able to make one non-Muslim accept Islam, it is a great thing. As the blood prophet said, as though it's like a red camel. You know, the red camel is the most treasured thing for the Arabs at that time, like a Rolls Royce. So number one is the profession of a da'i. Try and invite people, the non-Muslim friends, the non-Muslim lady that you have to the fold of Islam. Number two would be for a lady is to do the profession of an Islamic teacher. She can be an Islamic teacher maybe for the ladies in a ladies Islamic university can be for a lady, can be in a ladies college. She can be an Islamic teacher in the school. Maybe for the girls in the secondary school or in the primary school. Maybe for all the children, for all the students. So next best is the profession of Islamic teacher. Number two. Motherhood is there. After motherhood, number one is Dai. Number two is uh, being Islamic teacher. Number three is being a doctor or being a gynecologist. Because if a woman becomes a gynecologist, a gynecologist is the doctor of the ladies, she is preventing many of her Muslim sisters from making the hijab. It's always advisable that a woman, when she goes to see a doctor for a health problems, she should go to a lady doctor. And we have less lady doctors today in the world, so it's a good opportunity that you can become a lady doctor and prevent the hijab from being broken for many of your sisters. Number four, that in the medical profession, you can be a pediatrician, that is a doctor for the children, and treat them. Number five is you can become a counselor. And normally it is good for a counselor to be a lady and it's very much possible that you can be a counselor for the, for the children and you can guide them as per the Quran and Sunnah. The next would be you can become a, a pediatrician 
a doctor for the for the ladies, number for the children. Gynecologist among the medical profession, number one is gynecologist for a lady. Second can be a pediatrician. Third can be a general physician for the ladies because it is preferable that a lady goes to a lady and a gent goes to a gent if they are sick. Like in Bombay, where we had the medical center where we used to give free treatment, we had two different entrances, one for the gents, one for the ladies. And for the gents, we had a gent doctor full time. For the ladies, we had a lady doctors. The children had option to go wherever they wanted. And we saw to it that there was complete hijab in the lady section. And it was, I, it was, I don't know of any other exclusive medical center anywhere in India, which is ladies doctor is the only for ladies and gen doctor only for gents. But this is what Asharia says. So you can become a doctor. After that, you can take up other professions, like be a businessman, etc. Sorry, you can become a businesswoman. What you have to realize that if you take any other profession, see to it that that profession is not against the Quran and Sunnah. It should not be against the teaching of the glorious Quran and the Sahih Hadith. But as I mentioned, the best is being a mother, and the next would be taking up the profession which gets the person to the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number one is a da'i, number two is an Islamic teacher. These things will get you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then the other profession comes being a doctor or doing business, etc. Hope that answers the question. Time is running short. We'll have only time to take one more question. And this will be the last question for this session. My name is Khalid. I am from India and I'm currently residing in Saudi Arabia. I am an IT networking and security engineer. I am working in one private bank in Saudi Arabia. I am not involved in interest riba, but I am working in the back end of the bank, which means a network engineer. Am I doing a sin and am I doing a war with Allah by working as a network engineer as work, by working as a network engineer in a conventional bank. As far as working in a bank for a Muslim is concerned, working in a bank on any position, it is haram. If you are working in a business in which the core activity is haram, then working in that company in any position is prohibited. Since riba is the twelfth major sin in Islam. You cannot work in any position, neither as a network engineer, neither as a manager, neither as a clerk, neither, neither as a person on the cashier counter, neither in security. All is prohibited because the core activity is prohibited. Similarly, you cannot work in an alcoholic company in any position. You cannot work as a manager of an alcohol company, you cannot work as a doorman, you cannot work as a driver, all is haram. If you are working in a company in which a small percentage of the activity is haram and you are not directly involved in that activity, then it is permitted. For example, if you are working in a five-star hotel, and in a five-star hotel, they serve alcohol in the bar, in the restaurant. So you cannot work in the bar, in the restaurant and serve alcohol, that is prohibited. But surely you can work as a receptionist in the five-star hotel, because that's permitted. As long as you don't work directly into the haram activity, a small portion, and the income from alcohol in a five-star hotel is negligible. It's a small percentage. So if you're working in a company in which small portion of the activity is haram, see to it you are not directly involved in that activity, that is permitted. But don't get involved in the activity directly. But if you're working in a company in which the major activity is haram, like working in a bank, conventional bank, which is based on riba, or working in an alcoholic company, this is haram in any position, even as a network engineer. This was the last question that we can entertain. And inshallah, we will meet next Sunday, we'll meet next Saturday. 
at the same time that is in Malaysia 11.30, in the Makkah time is 6.30 and GMT is 3.30 for the next session of Ask Dr. Zakir till we meet next week. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa akhirul dawan alhamdulillah bil alameen. Yeah.